Welcome back, Yasmin Probst. Yasmin, welcome. Happy Healthy Bite. How are you both? Very, Very well, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So a big week for you, Yasmin, and we'll come to that in a moment with your newly hot off the press mm. conversation article, which we will discuss. But at the moment, we're working our way through the vitamins and we're deep in the Bs. Mm-hmm. I think we're up to B4 at this point. B5. B5, B5. B5. that's B5. right. Oh, yes. dear. Mm, B5. Because there was no B4. That's, that's right. That was, yeah. <laughs> that was the trick, Dorothy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so tell us about B5. So B5 is what we call pantothenic acid, which is such a mouthful, it's much mm. easier to refer to as B5. Um, it, as all the other B vitamins, is required for energy production in the body, so conversion of our carbohydrate, our protein and our fats from our food into energy that we can use. And it's found in a range of different food products. So you can find it in things like egg yolk, broccoli, fish, Mm. sunflower seeds. So a bit of a mixture of Mm, different foods there. Very different Mm. things. Yeah. Yeah, I did notice in the derivation of the word, I like the derivations Mm. of words. And in Greek, um, panthe means all or everywhere. Mm. So which is is definitely everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So it does amaze me that when people created these names that they Mm. sort of sense that and... And I think the same was the, one of the vitamins, we sp- the choline that we spoke about last week, how research is so far back, just had such great insight. <laughs> yes, yes. It's quite amazing, actually. Um, I mean, even with the pantothenic acid, um, a lot of the work that they did in terms of deficiency states and so forth is from the World War II times, mm. where they were finding certain patterns of, I guess, deficiency symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where really the deficiency work has largely stemmed from. So, you know, you don't want to have things like the irritability or restlessness or fatigue or numbness that they found there. But those were the key symptoms that they found for pantothenic acid. Mm. Um, and that's the time. Mm. moved through right until today. Mm. Mm. So what do we do? Um, we just eat our normal diet and... Yeah. Largely for this one, mm. yes. So if we just continue to eat um, a healthy, balanced diet, you'll probably be able to address most of the foods where we find pantothenic acid. Mm. Um, but in terms of the amount that we need, if you think about you know, shiitake mushrooms are another source of pantothenic acid, two cups of those give you your entire amount that you need um, for a daily intake. Right. You, know, you can quite easily eat your two cups of pan- uh, pantothenic <laughs> acid, or <laughs> mushrooms rather. Laced with pantothenic acid. Well, when it's found in so many different foods, yes. it seems like it would pr- be quite an easy one yeah. to get mm. that quantity, yeah. mm, to eat that exactly. quantity each day. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's really quite a straightforward um, vitamin in terms of finding that. And I mean, mm. as we've sp- spoken about before, the B vitamins are water soluble, so we would do pass a lot of that out in our urine. Um, and it is one of those sources that we can find quite easily for mm. most people as well. Mm. I did um, bring in a show and tell. And, uh, Yasmin, I'll just get you to shake it. That, dear listeners, <laughs> is a bottle of multi bees. Mm. And it's full of the bees that we're talking about. But I just noticed, I just sort of curious, curiosity looked at vitamin B5. And in each tablet, there's 50 milligrams. And I think that the daily amount that you need of actually of b5 is just minuscule it is yes. much smaller than that yeah, yeah. it's like milligrams we only need four to six milligrams in for adult males yeah. and females so that's quite a large amount there isn't yeah it? wow the so is there a problem with taking a lot more well, I mean, there are definitely issues with having too much. Mm. Most of it is generally passed through the urine, as I've already right. mentioned. Yep. Um, but if you do have too much, you can have problems like you get heartburn, calcification of your blood vessels, um, even good old diarrhea pops mm-hmm. up as well. Mm. You, know, you, you don't really want to have an overdose of anything. Mm, no. um, it's never, never a mm. good thing. But that is one of the things about supplements, you know, even from a pharmaceutical perspective, is that they are more than just supplements, mm. as well as being in quantities that are generally way, way higher than we would actually need from a, a, a nutritional perspective, unless you've actually got a deficiency. They are also, they're not actually natural. People think that they're mm. sort of naturally, you know, oh, it's, I'm just taking some vitamins. But they're actually all chemically synthesized. Yeah. And um, I do pick that, I picked that up from your, um, the Vitamania program that you were on, on SPS, with the big factories just pounding out, you know, things, even things like vitamin C. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's so easy to quickly pop a pill. Mm. But, you know, thinking about it in hindsight, is that really the best thing for you? Mm. And often, probably, it isn't. No. Can I just ask, is it the higher dosage of the vitamin, say, for example, B5 in this multi-B that we've mm. got here, is that absorbed less efficiently than eating B5 through broccoli, egg yolks, everything else that we've talked about? 
There are definitely differences in the bioavailability depending on the form of the particular yeah. vitamin. Um, because we've only just had a look at this, I haven't had a look at the details no. of which form it is. Yeah. But yes, there are differences between eating it in a whole form and yeah. a, I guess, chemically synthesised Synthesi- form. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, and, and because, Jasmine, as you always say, that's not just the vitamins we're getting out of that food that we're eating. That's right. There are so many other things. Mm. And, um, you know, why not make the most of that? It just sounds straightforward to yeah. me. It's so simple mm. to go for the, the bigger package of yeah. lots of good things rather mm. than just the one. Which leads us quite nicely to the conversation article that was out this morning, uh, November the 12th, uh, by Dr. Yasmin Probst, entitled Five Food Mistakes to Avoid If You Are Trying to Lose Weight. Mm. So, and, and big congratulations to Yasmin. She's had over 100,000 reads. Yeah, we've just cracked 100,000 reads. I was amazed. Mm. Yeah, well well done you. You have had a series of these and this looks really obviously topical Mm. if that many people have read it and it's only really the middle of the day. So, yeah. So can you take us through this? Sure. Well, I mean, the work from this was underpinned by what we did in our clinical trials. So um, at Wollongong, we've been working on clinical trials with food for quite a number of years. And working as a dietitian, also in private practice, I've seen common patterns coming up with people you know oh i eat this particular thing and it's good for me because of x y mm. and z and i thought oh this probably isn't the case and this misinformation spreads so quickly so i felt it was the time to help people and inform them of you know what really could be done better mm. I, I, i've got the five food mistakes just written down yes we might just go through yeah. them i think because mm. they, they're interesting i think they sound very commonsensical but like you say um people do get a little bit confused i think with some of the information Definitely. that's out there so the first food mistake is that all salads are good for you and that, that's the assumption yes that, that is the assumption and a lot of people do head into you know going out for dinner with friends or so on and they go oh, i'll just have something light i'll have a salad <laughs> And if, you, if you've ever ordered a Caesar salad, um, mm-hmm. that's probably one of the biggest or one of the higher calorie salads that you can find and often has the, you know, just add chicken or just add this, just add that as an accompaniment to the salad. Mm. So just the lovely cost lettuce leaves on their own would be beautiful. Lots and lots of vitamins <laughs> there. But no, we're adding on the bacon. We're adding on the croutons. We're adding on the parmesan cheese plus the latherings of dressing that mm, always goes on a Caesar very salad. Creamy mm, very, yes, very creamy dressing. Very, very creamy. stays at the bottom of the bowl. Mm, There's so much there. Mm. Yeah. So just that on its own is already 70% of what we need of our fat intake. Mm. Oh, shame. So that's just one meal. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 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 So not really recommended. Yeah. So suggesting Common. salads, but go easy on the dressing, or maybe just some lemon juice and exactly. some a little yes. s- you can yeah. olive oil. You can always ask for different things. Yeah. So if you are eating out, you can be, you know, a little bit picky and ask for, could I please have this removed, or could I please have this instead? Mm. You don't have to stick with exactly what's on the menu, no. mm. um, particularly well, on the if you're trying to lose mm. weight. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, okay. That's okay. A good one. The second one is that. Um, is what people determine to be healthy snacks. People think they're eating healthily mm-hmm. because they're eating healthy things like muesli bars. Yay, come on down, muesli um, bars. You know, or lots of other things that are, I think are marketed as being a healthy snack. Mm. But in fact, as you said in your article, are probably all the ingredients are being held together with sugar. Most of the time they yeah. are, yes. I mean, it's not to say that every single muesli bar out there is bad. That's not what I'm trying to say in this particular piece. But a lot of the time to keep them in that nice little block shape, Mm -hmm. um, they are stuck together with something, some form of sugar, whether it be a syrup, whether it be a honey, whether it be goodness knows any of the other types of sugar, but they're really the key ingredient and often high up on the ingredients list as well, Mm. which means that they're really in high amounts in that particular food item. Mm. And Megan, we spoke about that with um, Dr. Louise McDonald, our our dentist Uh, friend on air for Dental Week. And it's one of the the dentist's curses as well, because Mm. the fruit that's in the muesli bars you know, get stuck up in between teeth and just won't budge, and you know is a you know great Causes cause of, of mm. um, decay. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a real downfall of our society, isn't it? This whole convenience thing. And when I read the healthy snacks, I immediately thought of children's lunch boxes, yeah. and recess because it's often parents looking for something quick to grab mm. to put in the lunch box, and something quick to grab often comes in a package mm. and with either high. High sugar or high salt in a lot of cases too. High salt, too. definitely. Yes, yeah, high that, sodium levels and mm. a lot of those um, rice crackers and all sorts of things. Yes, mm. anything with the added flavourings mm. does often contain a lot of mm. salt in it as well. Yeah. So, so checking the back of the package, I mean, all most 
processed foods are required to have the nutritional information on the back. So if you were comparing and contrasting in the supermarket aisle to look for the total energy cholesterol, uh, calories for, would be something beneficial? That, that's an option. Um, it does get a little bit overwhelming for some mm. people to have a look at the all the numbers and everything on the back. And there are some handy little apps uh, out there that can help people. So mm. there, there is a free app called Food Switch. Mm-hmm. It actually gives you recommendations for healthier products. Right. Um, so that's a nice little one if you're looking for better products and you're out shopping and you just don't know where to start. Yep. Um, it saves a lot of reading and understanding of the information and the detail. Mm. But generally, yes, having a look at the nutrition information panel and the ingredient listing in particular, because those ingredients that are higher up on the list are the ones that are in the largest amounts in that particular product. And yeah. if you see sugar up on the list, well, it's going to be quite high again. sugar. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yes. Okay, this next one, I was a little bit sad about this. Natural sweeteners are better than sugar. So you're saying here that some people are adding honey and artificial sweeteners and that really... There's not a lot of difference? No, unfortunately there isn't very much difference. Um, I mean, ethically speaking, there may be a difference there, but generally sugar is sugar. It may not be called sugar at that particular point in time, but all of the, the syrups, the honeys, the various forms of sweetening, they just have different names, but they basically provide you with calories mm. and not much else. Mm. So our body's going to process them to the end result, which is ultimately going to be not good for us. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's not really... That's, and sorry, honey. I'll, I'll, honey. Yeah, that's, I'll, <laughs> that's my thing. I love, love honey. But if you're using it, if you are using honey instead of sugar, but being aware that yes, in I actual am, fact it's yeah. a sugar substitute, then, then sugar. that's yeah. sense. You know. I do stop my children because they could probably pour half a jar of honey on their right. mix whatever in the morning. Mm. But, um, yeah, we do limit that. As long as it's good, un, uh, non-adulterated un, local honey. Local, local honey, honey, definitely. Exactly. Yeah. There's so much lovely local honey. Okay, anything fruit-based must be healthy. Mm. Yeah, so all of our fruit smoothies and all of our fruit drinks that we see everywhere, people assume mm. it's got the word fruit in it or it's got the name of a fruit. This must be good for yeah. me. And I guess moving away from drinks there to a very, very common one, the good old banana bread. Mm. Mm. So so many <laughs> so many cafes popping up these days. You have the banana bread sitting just by the side there and people are like, oh, I'll just grab a bit of banana bread. It'll be good for me with my coffee. Mm. The only it's, good bit's it's really a the cake. name. It's a cake. It's a it cake. really yeah. is a cake. I mean, yeah. anyone that makes banana bread knows what goes into Ooh, it. Oh, yeah. yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lots and lots of butter goes into those, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> and sugar. And lots of sugar. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is that drinks. Uh, drinks equals lots of kilojoules quite often. Mm. Yes, it does. And we have a few different drink cases there, I guess, that we can refer to. I mean, I've touched on um, the smoothies and the fruit drinks already, which was part of our last food mistake. Mm. But the ones here that I'm really referring to are our soft drinks and our mm. alcohol. Um, the Australian intakes in that space are quite scary. Mm. Um, I mean, our soft drinks, the teenage boys are the highest soft drink consumers in the mm. Australian population. And we have something like 51% consuming soft drink. 51% of teenage wow. boys. Wow. Wow. Mm. Regularly, presumably. Regularly, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's just scary in itself. Yeah. Um, but then after that, it doesn't get much better because there are still 44% at age 19 to 30. So they've just moved on up and a few of them have dropped off and moved on to alcohol. something different. Yes. Probably alcohol. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Yasmin, energy drinks are inclu- in- probably included yes, in that. Yes, they are. That, um, that percentage or that statistic? The power, the, so, yeah. yeah. The, the, what they're thinking is thinking replacing they're, electrolytes that's right, and stuff. You know, they're, but pl- they're playing sport and so they're going mm. to have a something afterwards yeah. and um yeah yeah and a lot sugar. of the time the people drinking those energy drinks aren't at the level where they would need to have a sports drink mm. they can probably just consume water, water. and yeah. that would be completely fine for mm. them it's really those elite athletes that would need those electrolyte mm. replacements mm. so i think for most of us if we actually wrote down what we um ate or drank in a day uh in a food diary sense i think we'd be probably quite surprised Yes, it's, that's one of our eye-opening exercises that we do as part of our research. Mm. Um, we have people write down what they consume for a certain number of days mm. and it really gets you focusing on what you are eating and it helps for us, the researcher, but it also helps the person actually participating in the research to become aware of all yeah. of these different aspects. Mm. Mm. Oh dear, 
Okay. Know, and as Yasmin did point out in her article that I have to tell everybody, <laughs> I was a bit devastated to find that two standard drinks of red wine is pretty much the same as having two cups of corn chips. Oh, dear. I'm sorry. So, can, yeah. so, uh, so <laughs> you, you have go. to at least give away eating sad. corn chips with, with your red, red wine. wine. That's yeah. right, yeah. 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 But then in summary, Yasmin, I know you said it's also important to look at the quantity of food we're eating as well. It very much is, yeah. and that's really the key to weight loss overall. So starting by looking at how much are you actually consuming, and a lot of people haven't become aware of that over time. Their plate size has just increased, yeah. mm. and it's in such small amounts that you aren't even aware of what's in front of you because you're just so used to portioning up that amount. Mm. But about reducing that amount by a substantial portion over time will definitely help to reduce those calories, which will help in turn then mm. to also a- increase the weight loss. Mm. Yeah. And of course, all of this is in conjunction with exercise as well. We can't yeah, yeah. do one without the without other. The other yeah. um, but mm. yeah, just a few food tips there that could mm. help people as we move into that time of year where we do it a lot more mm. at Christmas time. Yes. yes. Although summer, you would, mm. I mean, a lot of people go, oh, summer's coming, got to sort of take you know, weight a little more seriously so I can fit into last year's summer clothes. Mm. Uh, so it is a good time to remind people to be a bit more mindful, if you mm. will, about what we are eating. So, yeah. Mm. So in speaking of mindfulness, um, I, we want to talk about some research that's been going on and it's been written by or one of the, the people involved in the research was very much, I think his topic wasn't mindfulness, uh, it was... Um, so you had quantities of food. Mm. Um, mindless, mindless eating is what he, um, he, he called it. And his name was Brian, uh, let me say his name right, was, was Wonsick. Wonsick. Mm. Mm. Tell us about Brian Wonsick. So he's one of the cases of nutrition research essentially gone wrong in the media recently and not just the media, in the scientific community generally. Mm-hmm. So he'd been researching for a number of years at Cornell University and was doing quite a lot in the nutrition space, was well known to many of us. And recently it was found that a number of his very high-impact journal articles had actually been flawed in a sense. So he had been accused of what's referred to as p-hacking, which is basically when you manipulate your data in a sense that you can receive a positive finding and if you don't receive that positive finding, you can tweak it a bit further mm. and you'll keep on going until you finally get that result that answers your question in the way that you want it to. And that's definitely not what we do um, as recommended practice in research, mm. um, whether that be nutrition or any other field. Yeah. But that was a very, very big issue. Um, he had five of his papers retracted um, and I think he's actually left his position from mm. what I've read as well. And from so. quite mm. prestigious art, um, journals, some of them were mm. for the Journal of Amer- American Medi- Medicine Association, JAMA, yes. which is one of the sort of top five journals in the world. Mm. Yeah, so very scary to see things like that happening. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's more of a reminder for people to be wary of what they read um, and to be wary of what's out there. It's not just nutrition, but it's, it's a nice example to talk about nutrition, that everything that's written on paper may not be exactly what yeah. you believe it to be. Mm. So there may be a spin put on that p- particular piece or there may be some underlying bias that has come through. There may be so many different factors that have come into play. Um, and so really question the research that you have in yeah. front of you. Mm. Because we have spoken about that before, mm. when the media gets hold of a, a, a title of an article or a journal or a piece of research, the spin that they can put on it can be what remains in people's minds and memories and in actual fact it can be you know not quite right Mm. Mm. and it's very hard to hose down that kind of information once it gets into the sort of public place um, so to speak yes yeah I was gonna say I think it's one of the biggest lessons for our children these days um, in this era of information to really be aware of the source Mm. and and to look at the credibility of what they're reading and not take everything at face value Mm. Mm. But it is also a shame in terms of a research community, you know, a researcher like yourself to have this sort of, I guess, blot. And Mm. it is obviously, you know, then a a necessity to sort of promote and, and I guess, um, make sure that people are aware of what is good research as well. Mm. But it is a shame when that, that sort of happens in the research world. But obviously... As a researcher, you know, methodology and um, adherence to protocols and open honesty is just paramount. 
Mm, it definitely is. And it, this release of these pieces, it really made us all question what we're doing. Are we, are we definitely doing everything correctly? Mm. And even though we knew we were, it just puts that concern in the back of your mind of, oh, my goodness, you know, if this could happen to such a leading name, mm. it could happen to absolutely anybody. Mm. But at the same time, being aware that human error does come into play yes. at times and yes. – we actually have a few students looking into that particular space of human error and how it impacts the results. And it was funny in some of their studies because they would approach research groups about the research topic that they were doing and there was a lot of resistance of, oh, no, no, our data is perfect. Um, so acknowledging the fact that no data set is perfect, no. mm. it, it doesn't exist, um, but doing the best that you possibly can to make sure that what you have in front of you is of the highest quality. Mm. 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 And being okay. open and transparent about the mm. um, the inadequacies or the, the deficits in your research because when you read a research paper, part of the discussion is about you know that's what right. could have been done differently yeah. or what wasn't included mm. because that's much of it is that it's not what's been presented it's what hasn't been presented mm. and certainly from a pharmaceutical perspective or medicines what doesn't generally make the press is the stuff that doesn't work mm. because there's no money in that and in terms of successful research and so forth so you could be doing drug trials or something in a particular disease and it sh you, what you read about is what it, where it does work but what you don't see is where it doesn't work and that's equally as important because mm. people will want to use it or mm. attempt to use it or actually start using it and knowing that there is either harms and no benefits is equally as important. Mm. And it's actually quite interesting from a research perspective to see, you know, what really didn't work. You know, there's this assumption that everything is working perfectly all 100% of the time, yeah. mm. but it's never that way. Mm. We have, there's always a lot of information that has been conducted where you don't find what you expect, but that's, that's a result in itself. Yes, that's indeed. exactly right. And it's actually yeah. a fascinating mm. result. Yeah. Mm. Why yeah. wasn't it that way? Mm. And then we can do further research to see, well, you know, this might be the new path that we then follow of this is a new assumption that we yeah. weren't even aware of. Because mm. ultimately that's what science is. It's learning and looking at what doesn't work to find out what does work. Mm. And so you losing that, that information from the milieu of information that's out there is really, really bad. But I guess it has come traditionally from how research has been funded and how universities have been funded as well. Mm. Not the one to get into politics here, but <laughs> certainly, you know, that you know that old adage which i think is changing a little yes and you can probably comment that publish or perish where academics have to really sort of churn to try and get a the benchmark of number of publications was one of the measures of success of an academic it, it definitely still is the case um but the those measures of success are expanding beyond just pure publications mm, mm. i mean p publications and grants really are the leading ones um but things like your community consultation things like the conversation piece yes. you know, mm. think they are actually quite useful in the space as well and they all show impact and engagement which is really our focus mm. um, from an academic perspective mm. well mm. if it comes to your kpis on conversation pieces you'll be doing very well mm. that's exactly so, right yes congratulations yeah. How it goes after a full day. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No. No, it's mm. very interesting, very practical. Yeah. I think that that's exactly what I think you know lay people need is the information that is really presented from an from an academic in very practical senses. Things that we probably know, but when you see it together, you go, "Yep, I really do know that," and I can put something into play in my own life. Mm. So hopefully, it'll help a few mm. people out there. Mm. It's been fascinating as ever. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. so your song. I think we're going to play your song from last week that I couldn't find because of my technical assistant let me down. <laughs> not me, I'd like to say. <laughs> no, not, not me. me. A that, smaller, that smaller version. The, that would be the 15-year-old um, yeah. in That's your it. life. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So, Yasmin, what song would you like us to play? So for today we've got Conrad Saul playing for us. And then next week we'll also be talking about um, vitamin B6, but it's a complex of